Good evening and welcome to tonight's In Conversation Live here from the Royal Society of Medicine. Before we start and introduce our guest, I just wanted to remind everyone that the great fun of these interactive sessions is that you make comments, ask questions that I can then ask Jennifer. And this way, it will be uh, a lot more interactive. So having said this, do participate. And I'd like to welcome uh, Jennifer and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Jennifer, Dr. De Jennifer Dixon, CBE, who has been Chief Executive of the Health Foundation since 2013. Thank you. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Henrietta, very pleased to be here. Shall we start with a very broad question about the Health Foundation? I was reading recently that under your leadership, it contributed to a decision by government in 2018 to invest an additional 20 billion pounds. Government invested a, an extra 20 billion pounds in the NHS. What, what exactly what role did you and the Health Foundation play? Well, I thank you, Henrietta. I seriously like to claim credit for all of that, but unfortunately, there are many, many hands in this uh, in this uh, recipe. Um, so just to say, for those of you who don't know us at the Health Foundation, we're an independent charitable foundation and what we're in the very luxurious position, which is unusual, of having a big endowment pot and we live off the interest. So we don't have to raise any money, which means we can be totally independent and we have a completely independent board. And you can imagine this is quite a nice part of civil society, particularly when something as contentious as the NHS is concerned and particularly when as contentious as health policy is concerned more generally. So we really do have a privileged position and it's a responsibility, I think, for all of us. King's Fund are in the same position, you, you know about those, and also the Nuffield Trust where I used to work as well, and Welcome as well, Welcome Trust. We're, we're number two in the pecking order of size of foundations after Welcome. We're a, quite a, a bit way down, but we are number two in the health foundation. Field. So that's quite a long preamble, but it's a really nice position. So without fear or favour, we can sort of try and contribute and our mission is to improve health and healthcare. So to actually tackle your question, Henrietta. Um, so we in, in, in our mission to improve healthcare, one of the things we do is to try to look at the long term issues. And one of them, of course, is funding. And uh, so we have really crack analysts at the Health Foundation. We have in-house teams. We give out grants as well and fund research. But our in-house team did some crack analysis with the Institute for Fiscal Studies to look at the long term projections for NHS funding. How much did we the NHS need? Um, relative to past investments and so we did lots of projections and came up with a figure. So in fact, there were three just to cut it cut it very briefly, there were three scenarios. One was not really managing. Uh, the second scenario in the middle was sort of steady as she goes. Uh, and the third one was a modernizing scenario. And the one we got was steady. It was the one in the middle, um, sort of steady. I mean, it was a bit parsimonious. So we came up with these uh, projections with the IFS and then we fed them into NHS England, to Department of Health and indeed via them to the Treasury. And I think it was because we and IFS are independent organisations and we'd really done the maths and the modelling that they took note of those. And that was stronger, obviously, than the NHS. Well, the NHS obviously has a strong hand, but because we were independent and we had no vested interests, I think that really did carry some weight. So skillful negotiation on the NHS's behalf, on the NHS uh, by them and also by DH. So very glad to, on the NHS's 70th birthday, to have a nice dollop of money. Not as much as we would have wanted, by the way, for a modernising scenario, but perhaps we can get on to that later. Um, so, that, that, so that's a long answer to your question, Henrietta. Uh, absolutely. So with looking back, um, uh, Presumably, then, you can say that the methods by which you arrived at that figure were, were indeed right. Uh, you were, and, and that, therefore, the same methodology in theory could be applied in the future. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely right. In fact, what we did was we set up a centre inside the Health Foundation full of economists, really good people, who cr crunched the numbers 
to do these long term projections based on supply and demand uh, costs, all sorts of things fed into the <clears throat> these complex models. Um, but the key thing here was that we were looking out 10 years and the NHS itself doesn't tend to have the luxury to be able to do that because, as you know, um, politicians uh, and indeed the NHS and Treasury and the department often live from hand to mouth. You know, we'd like to have 10 year funding settlement for the NHS. You'd think with British with Britain's biggest industry, that would be a basic thing to do with something with such a solid business as the NHS. But no, you'd be you'd be mistaken because actually it's normally hand to mouth every year or more recently for three a three year settlement. Uh, but we think obviously long term planning for a huge asset like the NHS. Um, it's not only Britain's biggest industry, it's it's Western Europe's biggest industry that actually you need steady planning of finances uh, based on demand and supply. You also need steady planning of workforce. And I think we're seeing some of the problems of not having that at the moment. And indeed, the government struck that down in the bill recently that the they, they request for independent long term projections of NHS staffing. So we still don't have that yet. Um, but um, so that was our contribution, yeah. I think. So, yes, we can do it into the future. And, and you can see how needed it is for a, for a single payer system like the NHS. Absolutely. It's very reassuring to know you're there. We'll get on to the workforce later on. I see that Graham uh, Winyard is saying, hi, Jennifer. Hi, Graham. Uh, great <laughs> to see you. You have seen the Department of Health and NHS England and its predecessors from within and without. How would you advise a dynamic young doctor who wants to change things in the NHS and is uncertain whether to work for think tank or the civil service all good wish at Graham what a great question lovely Graham Graham and I go back a long way I was in the department in 1998 working for the chief of the NHS and Graham was there uh, as a medical advisor weren't you senior medical advisor Graham um, yes so young doctors so um, perhaps I can just step, step back it's a really good question Graham and uh, one of the privileges of my job is that we fund something called the Harkness Fellowship Programme, which takes people um, interested in health policy um, to the United States for a whole year to study. It's really luxurious and you can you design your project and it's just a, a year of thinking. And what I find is that a lot of young doctors come to me around their late 20s late 20s, early 30s. And what's happened is that they've really worked hard to get where they are. They've 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 given their two pounds of flesh to study medicine and then do the junior doctor roles. And some of them are kind of thinking, well, before I settle into a big specialty, um, I just want to know whether there's more, you know, what can I do? And they are looking at that point to take a sort of detour to try and sort themselves into perhaps what might be a more fitting path or indeed convince themselves they really do want to go back to the ward, hopefully many of them will, uh, to do whatever it is that they want, want to do. And the kinds of things that they do include, as Graham quite rightly says, you know, you can go into academe, um, into uh, public health, into the Department of Health itself, into a policy think tank or foundation like the King's Fund ourselves and others. Uh, some go to um, work in uh, with the chief medical officer. There's a fellowship program, Darcy Fellows, you'll remember that, and can, they're dotted around NHS England. Um, some are, um, uh, what else are they doing? Some are going for the arm's length bodies, working in NICE, for example. And I think it's really healthy for these talented individuals, multi-talented, um, and not just good at medicine or science, but actually really good at many other sort of sets of, of intelligences to have a go and try the, 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 themselves at these at different areas. Hartness Fellowship is another one, for example. So um, I would say the most important thing to do as a young doctor, once you've heaved yourself off the ward, is to have some breathing space and try and sort yourself into what you think is the right route. And I think you soon can figure out, if you haven't already at that point, whether you really are an academic animal, whether you are a think tanky policy type of animal, whether you really want to, a doer and want to sort of improve care on the wards, or whether you want to go into management, whatever it is. And it's time well, well spent just to take a year thinking about that if you are able to find a, a, a perch. Um, so that's the advice I would give. And, um, you know, there's probably about 
four or five different archetypes of, of cognition, I, I call it, that young doctors have. And uh, I think they just need a bit of breathing space to be able to 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 sort themselves into a route, find what what suits them as an animal, as it were, and then um, go from there. Because if you don't do that, you, life can be very frustrating and you can sort yourself into, I don't know, acute surgery or um, management even. And it's not quite right. So 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 try and seek some space i think is the is the better you're, you're worth it is what i would say <laughs> thank you jennifer we, we have a couple more questions in the chat uh, malcolm Brigler says does the health foundation have a keen interest in high street digital health hubs as does the king's fund for london um Yes, I, I think that's a very specific um, interest. I mean, I think what we are interested in at the Health Foundation is to help the NHS improve faster than it has in, in the past, to try out and test innovation, particularly innovation, and this gets to the question, innovation that happens outside of hospital to help people um, manage care better at, at themselves or in a community setting rather than having to uh, stuff off to the hospital the whole time. So, in so far that high, high the, the kinds of innovations you're describing uh, in the high street are, uh, are, are are worth testing, are valuable, are high quality, are efficient. Then of course we will be interested in that. Not just testing them and, and evaluating them, which is what we do, but also seeing what are the conditions for spreading them around the country. Because as we all know, innovation in the pipeline innovation isn't necessarily the issue holding back the nhs it's more spread once innovation has happened so it's 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 holding people's hands it's taking them through uh through good management trying to get them to test and uh understand and feel safe with new forms of care i think this is the this is the engine for change in the future more than the kinds of big reform programs that we've had in the past which i think are pretty old style if i'm really honest i think it's really much more about the business of health sorry the the front line and how that can be speeded up much more and science and technology and staff and management and creativity and innovation which is more than whether or not these or that financial incentives this or that amount of regulation these targets or those targets those will be there but actually the future we have to get onto this other piston engine which is front line innovation and care and support so you can say a lot more about that but that's where i think it's at jennifer just before we we move on to a very cracking question from our president can you just i'm just aware that i know plenty of people on this uh, now tonight who are not colleagues uh, could you just in two sentences say what a high street digital health hub is because i'm sure some people might be perplexed what 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 can we say it is well, I, I don't know precisely what it could be, but I guess it's a high street, a place in the high street where people can go for um, diagnostics, is what yeah. I imagine, um, using digital technologies. There's a whole Perfect. range of things. So it's that kind of thing. I mean, there'll be a different types, but essentially that's it. Thank you so much. And thank you, Malcolm. Now, Roger Kirby, our president, says, £20 billion pounds is a lot of money, but is it enough, Jennifer? <laughs> that, that's a great question. Thank you so much for that one. Well, how much is enough? Is the NHS underfunded? Can it ever have enough money? These questions have, have been uh, uh, close to me for the last, since I started in medicine, actually, dare I say it, in 1984, 38 years ago. Um, and um, to be honest, there's no right answer as to how much uh, money the health service needs for the NHS or indeed any other healthcare system in the world. Um, so the question is, I mean, if, uh, so there's no normative answer, just to put it sort of more precisely. Um, the looking back over the since 1948, the average kind of real terms growth every year is just south of 4%. So that's the kind of growth that can help um, the NHS grow. And indeed, that's not dissimilar to many other health systems in the world. Um, perhaps a little bit less, certainly, than some healthcare systems we like to compare ourselves to, like Germany, like Switzerland, for example, or indeed the Netherlands. 
Um, now, 4%, 3.8% sounds a lot, especially with low growth in the economy. So the issue at the moment is, of course, I think you all know that over time, the NHS as a chunk of public spending has just eaten up more and more. Uh, to the point that it's something it's between 13 and 40% day to day spending of in the public sector and over time the spending on the NHS has increased at the expense of other things like defence, like education, I mean almost everything else it has to be said. So there comes a point where um, you know, there, there's no break on that quite yet, um, but the, obviously the name of the game then is to try to live within a certain seemly amount, which is usually anything between 0.5 and 4%, but to seek constantly seek uh, efficiencies of the type that we need, given that demand is not exactly going down, is it? Not least with all the chronic diseases and demography and so on. So that's why there's no right answer, but the, if there is one answer, it is to have constant, uh, relentless focus on uh, efficiency and value for money, which really means technological change uh, of the type. We, no doubt we can go on and, and develop. So to, to really get serious about that and to invest in order to save, and I think just one other thing on that is that the, what you spend on kit and technology is really important. What you spend on buildings and capital is really important because you can't really innovate unless as, as if you if you haven't got the right settings. So um, so there we are spending is pretty poor compared to we, you know we spend less than half of Denmark that's GDP per capita on capital, uh, half of Germany it, it's 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 it, it's poor so we need to a bit like business in Britain we don't invest as much as we should do in capital and and technology, so I think the answer is it's roughly between 0.5 and 4 is the kind of running rate of, of increase in real terms increase. But we within that, there is a lot of work we have to be doing on efficiency. Without that, you know, there is a sustainability issue. Thank you. We'll come back to that, actually, because I'm interested in the methodology used to work out um, the outcomes and the effectiveness of the measures. But let's talk about um, the next question is from Daniela Bazutahoun. How does a junior doctor know if health policy is for them without having experienced it? Is there any way of getting experience initially before applying for fellowships, which are presumably extremely competitive? <laughs> Yes, I think, you see, when I was, a, if I can go back sort of several eons ago to when I was a junior doctor, um, I, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. There were no, there were very few options in those days. But but I think, I think if you're, I think I was dimly aware that it, it, the medicine per se itself wasn't quite enough. Um, so, so basically, you just have to seek routes to try to understand what might be another thing that you might be very suited to. And I think there are inklings. I think, uh, are you interested in uh, policy seminars? Are you interested in politics? What's on your reading pile by your bed? Is it science or is it political analysis? Um, um, could you, um, is your, the place where you work, will, will they allow you a secondment for a few months to be attached to a, a unit to, um, I don't know, have a break. Um, um, I think probably if, if you're very sort of knee deep in a clinical work, I think that probably the, the, the first minor step is just to attend some policy seminars like this. And luckily with virtual working, it's all a lot more accessible, isn't it? Have a look and see whether you like the cut of the jib of the policy people. Um, is it all gobbledygook? Is it something that really could be interesting? Um, and then if that's the case, then I think you can take more formal steps. The people who apply for our policy fellowships are, are usually a bit older um, than junior doctors, um, but it's nothing to stop junior doctors for, from taking some time out to gain, getting, a, say, a DARSI fellowship or something like that. I, I think they still exist. Um, or even just being seconded to an organisation for a few months in between jobs. That's all possible. You just have to set it up yourself. And luckily, there's far more options now. It's um, there's something called the Foundation for Medical Leadership. 
um, clinical medical leadership and FL, I can never remember the acronym, but if you contact me afterwards, I'll be happily put you in contact with them. And they have lots of options that, that, that you can consider, which isn't like taking a million steps away from, from clinical medicine, because that's a bit scary, isn't it, to do that? Thank you, Jennifer. We can facilitate that via the RSM if there's a problem with reaching you. Judith uh, Varley says, how can the public work with professionals to improve things with our grassroots feedback? Uh, well, thank you, Judith. That's a really big question. And um, I mean, there are lots of routes, aren't there, to try to influence the quality of care and the shape of care from very local involvement in Health Watch. Um, to over, overview and scrutiny committees, to being uh, helpful to your local trust itself. Um, there will be patient groups there who can help to give feedback to try and improve care. So those are the usual me methods. And then these days, a lot of public bodies um, at national level have public meetings that they invite the public to and to give their views. That's another route. And there are lots of different ways now of um, through public and patient engagement mechanisms, panels in providers, in universities, on research. There's, there's, there's actually a huge range of opportunities, if, if that's the kind of thing you, you, you were meaning by your question. Um, so I would say there's tons. It depends quite how you want to input. Do you want to try and improve care directly, in which case a local option is, is very good? Or do you want to somehow influence research, in which case there are public, there's lots of opportunities there for getting involved. Thank you. John Rudd says, I regret asking an awkward but unnecessary question. Would our guest agree that in order for effective reform of the NHS, it requires more clinicians in management roles and that there are far too many unnecessary management posts? John <laughs> Rudd, medical legal, retired. Not at all awkward question. Thank you so much for that. Um, well, I do believe it's very important for medics to be in management, for clinicians, actually, whoever they are to be in management. The more you know about the frontline stuff, the better I think it is if you're trying to manage those teams. And, um, you know, you just look at other countries and you see a lot more physicians in, engaged in management. I think, you know, in the US, you know, usually if you speak to a chief executive of a large hospital, they're almost certainly going to be a physician, which is quite interesting. It's, it's very um, much rarer here. So I think that's sort of axiomatic, really. I'd be interested if there are any physician ma managers on the call who might have a view there. In terms of do we have too many grey coats, as they used to be called, too many managers, too many uh, bureaucrats, um, I think, in the current goal. I mean, if you look at our figures um, compared to other countries, um, we are low on managers. So I think there's a greater argument to say we are undermanaged than overmanaged, even with definitional issues between countries. Um, and if you look at actually the growth of staff over time, particularly over the last 10 years, you will find that managers as a group, as a sector, have grown the least compared to other. I mean, I think it's almost around nursing proportions, slightly less even. So I don't really think that we are under managed, if, if that's the root of the question. Let me move on to John Jewell's question. How has the Derek Wanless reviews predictions on the rise in the NHS funding as percentage of GDP held since he reported in 2007? Uh, also, his three scenarios about public health engagement. Yes, well, for the, for the uninitiated, Derek Wanless was a retired um, banker, I think he was, wasn't he? And um, he did a big review of the NHS funding with the Treasury way back in the early 2000s. Um, and he did some very interesting modelling. In fact, the person who led that modelling is now the person who's leading our modelling that I referred to earlier, Anita Charlesworth, who used to lead the public um, uh, public spending team at the Treasury. And uh, what Derek did was he, ba they basically had three scenarios. I can't remember what they were, what they were called. Those basically people get sicker, people stay about the same, and then people are fully engaged by, um, you know, preventing, at being healthier and preventing and all the rest of it. And, uh, and it came up with three kind of scenarios for spending. Um, and 
from memory, um, that certainly did unlock some cash, although Tony Blair, from those of you who remember the, the famous Breakfast with Frost announcement, Tony Blair had already ma made the announcement that he wanted to give the NHS unprecedented real terms increase, which certainly happened. It was double digit, actually, real terms increase, not the usual paltry 3.8%, which happened in the early, early 2000s because of the state of the economy as much as anything else but also for other reasons. Anyway, so Derek Wanless was brought in by Gordon Brown to work with the Treasury to try to see how that, what should be the run rate over time. And um, th I mean, those those predictions, you know, looking back, you know, they were they were good, um, but they were they didn't have as much data as we now have. So we can now update them quite considerably. But to, to the point, Derek had this fully engaged scenario where we were all fully engaged in in helping it get ourselves healthy. The population had lots of prevention and so on. Um, we didn't reach that because we didn't invest as much in prevention as we perhaps should have done. And so consequently, it's not just because of that, but the population um, you know, there are some very worrying signs, as you know, of risk factors, not so much with smoking, where we there's a real success story way down now to 14 percent uh, smoking rate, but really obesity, which I don't think anyone here needs reminding. Uh, and of course, the increase and in rise of chronic disease um, and uh, coupled with longevity. So, there, so we're facing all of that. Um, so I think Derek did a great job. We can up, we've updated it and are doing it a lot, a lot more. In a, in a lot more sophisticated way, given the data management and crunching capacity we now have. So, um, but the bottom line is, yes, we need to do far more in prevention. I mean, I just wasn't one last sentence. This particular centre I was describing, we look back and looked over the last 20 years to look at where the NHS budget had increased and what, what had the money been spent on. And the lion's share of all of that has gone into hospital. But if you look at primary care and certainly prevention, really has hardly is hardly I mean with with a little blip more latterly so I think there's a real issue about the skewing of spend towards the hospital the gravitational pull towards the hospital which I think we just have to address so that's one of Derek's legacies I think we have to continue to to remind ourselves of. You mentioned obesity and just before I go back to the questions from the delegates I just want to uh, make us reflect for a moment. We had Cameron, we had Theresa May, then we had Boris Johnson. We have 689 obesity policies uh, in the last 30 years, 14 obesity strategies, and nothing ever seems to change too much. Uh, what do you feel about the uh, delay uh, in the recent strategy? Yeah, I mean, there's some been really good analyses of these multiple obesity strategies, just as you say, Henrietta. And if you look back over the last 30 years, not only do you see multiple um, strategies, just as you say, but you also see multiple repeats of incremental policies that are then not implemented, which is quite interesting. And 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 the other thing that you see is that a large um, chunk of those policies, the flavour is that is that the individual is the person, it, that it's the individual that is focused on, individual agency is relied upon. So what by that I mean that, you know, it's all about food labelling, you will be given more information to make better choices kind of thing, as opposed to a recognition that it is the unhealthy obesogenic environment in which you live that might be affecting things. Um, so just as a, a small detail, if I might, I saw recently a, an interesting picture and on the left hand side was a picture of a beach in 1971 and it had full of people enjoying the sun. And then there was a picture of exactly the same beach, same month, same day uh, in 2016. Same thing, same number of people, but almost everyone seemed overweight. So you have to ask yourself, it, what's happened since 71 and 2016? Has biology changed? No, it hasn't. Has collective willpower changed? I can't believe that's right, really. Um, so what has changed is that we have flooded our markets with obesogenic food and made it cheap. So uh, if if we think that, then we need more activity on it. And I think you can see, can't you, with the recent bog off um, rowback and the comments made by the prime minister about it, 
that um, even tentative steps towards addressing some of the wider determinants of obesity that can help people make better choices but but change the um, those have they, they just can't go there um, and I don't know whether it's probably more recently for political reasons because there's clearly a right wing of the government to be pacified and and that right wing simply does not like the idea of any form of you know regulation or um, you know restrictions of the type that need to take place with obesity we're not alone actually because other countries are facing similar issues but we are fatter if i can use that um, pc term than most other european nations and you know with two-thirds of the population overweight or obese when are we going to call time on this when are we going to get muscular about it when are we going to do the equivalent of polluter pays, address the commercial determinants, investors, um, and so on and so forth. So that is a real, so the, 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 the interesting analogy here is green. We don't ask, we don't blame the public for using CO2 because of the choices that they make, really, do we? We are, the government is busy um, creating policies that so that we can use less CO2, which mean that the context is changed, so we're able to make those choices. I can't buy an electric car if they don't exist, for example. So, so in a sense, we don't like the nanny state for food, but we are being a nanny state, or at least more of a nanny state, quite appropriately to try to get us to net zero. So what's the net zero equivalent for obesity that we want to act on? So I think, um, so anyway, that's, it's, it's, um, there's some inconsistency in approach, I think, that we need to really think. And, and, and final point is that if we are thinking about prosperity, not just about economic capital, and uh, you know how much money we have or profit um, or, or now green capital um, but we also be, we need to be thinking of human capital health capital and if we do that then we have to think of what levers and tools that we can create to give us the best outcome and that isn't just relying on individuals who have constrained choices for all sorts of reasons you've um, you've given me an idea for an rsm meeting where we look at the environment uh, because of course there were plenty of lessons learned with the tobacco industry and the tobacco changes the government eventually uh, implemented with significant results so so anyway maybe we will take yes. offline here but it would be good to organize a meeting around that now let me move on to Mohammed Abu Saleh saying the health foundation has pioneered person-centered care how do you foresee its adoption by the NHS thank you Mohammed person-centered care um yes well, I think what is what what is at the heart of something called person centered care is to have the patient much more engaged and uh, in care and listened to, quite frankly. Um, so I know it's a cliche, but of course, most of the time we are our own doctors, aren't we? And yet, as soon as we hit the NHS, we often become very passive patients and sort of sit and watch um, so person-centered care is about listening it's about engaging it's about starting where the patient is um, because so many conditions that we have are not single conditions are they they are connected to wider social issues they're linked to lifestyle they're linked to family situation and so on and um, uh, and also, it may be that that some individuals, some patients, you know, don't see things in the same way we do with respect to the risks of treatment, with respect to possible side effects, and so on. So it really does make sense. Um, what's is, what's at issue, of course, is the time involved and the effort and the energy that's that needs to take place to structure things around patient choice and to listen. And there, I think we've got a long way to go. It's not just the time and money. This is also about orientation and behavior with clinical people who are experts and who are not necessarily used to thinking of patients as experts themselves. So um, I think it's, so, so the question is, is how to get more of it inside the NHS? Um, I don't know is the answer. I think this is another cultural issue which over time as patients become more confident, 
uh, as patients know a lot more about their condition, uh, maybe as patients see how other services that they are offered and engage with go on, that there will be a, a, a you know gradually a change whereby you know patients are less patient, less accepting, less disengaged, um, and not willing to be a pawn any longer. So, um, so I think it's um, there's no there's no quick fix here, I'm afraid. Um, but I do think time is on our side. A uh, question from Eric Will. Uh, would you comment on the comparison of quality improvement at local levels and the systemic aspirations of implementation science in regard to the facilitations the Health Foundation might provide? For example, how can local enthusiasms and ownership be folded into general application? Yes, it's a great question. And and what this is about is about spread, really. It's what we call spread, isn't it? It's how you how you take a really interesting innovation and spread it further um, using various techniques. So um, there is for those the uninitiated, the quality improvement, I, I would I'm sure most of you. I mean, those are very bland terms, aren't they? But quality improvement, as I think it's meant in this question, refers to a kind of approach to trialing iterative improvement. It's a systematic way of, 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 address, of trying to say that um, there's your everyday job and there's improvement and the two things are both, both of your jobs. So every day you seek some improvements and there are QI, quality improvement, is a systematic way to approach that and measure it and then feedback change and then um, make iterative course corrective improvements to make, to improve everyday care. Um, so that's a so that's really a, a noddy version. And there are lots of different types of techniques. But um, the the Health Foundation has pioneered some of these and and promoted quite a lot of these uh, quality improvement techniques brought from other industries, famously Toyota, but not just Toyota, uh, to try to speed up change and. I think we know that those hospitals, for example, that do have some kind of systematic QI technique are most likely to be rated uh, the highest rated from the CQC um, rating for quality, for example. So it really does matter. And it is surprising to me that after so long, um, we haven't got this kind of uh, systematics approach to management from the very front line. Uh, really woven throughout the NHS. It, I don't know why it's been such hard work. We have found it hard work. It's not really taken seriously as it has as it should be at the top for many years. Um, I think people have sort of tolerated it as being a kind of exotic thing to do or, you know, I, I caricature. Um, but I think if we are going to try to test systematically and at scale new technologies, we have to use the, these kinds of techniques that to do it faster and more safely. Um, so um, I would be all for everybody in the NHS who's a manager um, studying these techniques and uh, promoting a, a culture and use of these techniques, adding in data to um, to test new technologies, new ways of service design, because unless we speed things up, we're not going to get anywhere. We're just going to be left behind at the same level of efficiency. And we know that at the same time costs are rising. So um, so I think that there's a so as for solutions, I think I think we need some top down messaging and support. And we also need some sort of bottom up sort of collaboratives to try out new things. And I, I think there needs to be a strategy and there hasn't been one for quite some time. I'm hopeful now with the current leadership in place in the NHS um, that there's going to be more of a focus on this and it's about time. Excellent. Here the positive uh, side of things. Tell us who your two mentors, if you had to think of the two people who really helped you in your career or, or role models, if you prefer, uh, rather than mentors, would you tell us about two people who played a part? Um, well, I don't have any formal mentors and I don't have a coach. I have to confess that. And I also confess, but don't tell anyone, I've never had any management training of any sort. So now that isn't that sounds like a badge of honour, but um, 
I'm sure my 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 errors are egregiously noted by all my staff here. Um, I think there are people. There's no there's no two individuals, but what there are, you know, there are insights from people who are pretty priceless, uh, and there's some very wise people around. I think I'd probably mention one, and I hope he's not watching because he'll blush terribly. But I think my I used to um, work for Alan Langlands, who was the chief executive of the NHS way back in uh, when I worked for him. He was uh, in the uh, 1990s. He uh, I think it was 90. Three to nine to two thousand, something like that, and I worked for him for two of those years. And he wasn't a medic, of course, but he he was just such a wise and astute, strategic, deeply human character, full of insights, full of generosity, and had um, you know was was just such a fair and open and clever individual. And I, I just learned so much from him, watching him, and particularly his choice of people, his intuition, how he drew on both his analytical background, because he, well, he did have a science degree, but also his intuitive human side to get the best out of people. And uh, he always had a good press, Alan. And so I've, I've learned a great deal from him. So I have a lot to owe him for over the last 20, 25 years, really. I think. I'd... Thank you for sharing that a more personal side of things. Now, Sarah Curtis says, does the Health Foundation modelling method include consideration of local and regional differences in population health and healthcare needs? Uh, Sarah is an academic a health geographer. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we do lots of different types of models, I would say. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and they would take into, I mean, some would take into account um, local or regional differences because we often do aggregate analyses based on uh, data for England or in some cases Scotland. Um, and that wouldn't necessarily take into account those um, regional and local data. It depends really entirely on what we're modeling. But we try and factor in as much as we can in in the analyses, and sometimes regions as a as a as a variable matters, and sometimes regions matter less. Um, so I think that the, the bottom line point is that is that in uh, there's 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 tons of variation around the NHS in the use of care, in the supply of care, in the demand for care. And it's very important to look at those patterns and to see why that is the case when, particularly if we're all trying to live within a budget, how do some areas do that more than others? So I think the answer is yes, that's a short answer to the question, <laughs> but it really depends on which area we're modelling. Uh, let's move on briefly to the tackling mental health disparities, a recent document. How, how, is the, how does it work when you think about closing the health gap for people with a mental illness? What is the best way to approach this? Yes, well, I confess I'm not a mental health expert, but what we what I can say is that we've, for those who, I'm sure you will know, but in case you didn't, we've um, done quite a lot of work on health inequalities around the country, and we funded the very excellent Michael Marmots uh, and his work, the Marmot Review 10 years on, if you remember that, which shows the increasing inequalities across the country or and the stalling of life expectancy and the life expectancy going into reverse for some parts of the country particularly the northeast the northwest the west midlands and in particular for women middle-aged women um, so we are really focused on that um, as much as any specific sort of issue like mental health which is profound um, so we haven't really got to the bottom of the reason why the health fabric is not is improving as it has in the past. Michael Marmot quite appropriately pointed to austerity, you know, the sort of fraying of the safety net, the welfare safety net, which is affecting people. Um, others have shown that the reason why for health inequalities growing is because the most deprived have um, slowed down even faster than everyone else. It's not that everyone's slowed down equally, but that those who are most deprived have slowed down the, the most. Um, it matters if you are in poorer communities in the northeast compared to 
the southeast. So not only do you have a rich poor health divide um, of um, you know, healthy life expectancy of nearing 10 years, but you have a poor, poor divide between the north and the south. And again, no one is, is really on top of that, I don't think. And then on top of all of that, what you've got is some parts of the country where the health fabric is fraying really dramatically and, and in certain age groups. And I would pick out there men um, between 25 and 45 in the northeast in the northwest and again in the west midlands and a lot of that is to do with um, uh, substance misuse it's to do with the kind of deaths of despair kind of tinge for those of you who know that work from the us um, so there are some communities that are really hurting i would say and as I said, Michael is pointing to austerity being the chief culprit, but we also know that life expectancy is stalled in countries that had no austerity. Um, so another factor which um, others, particularly Angus Deaton and Anne Case, have pointed to is long run economic structural issues which deindustrialize communities, leave them high and dry and beached and have crushed their social their, their lives. And those who can't get out are just left beached with very little opportunity, which then leads to a kind of malaise and despair, which really eats away at the health fabric, because we know stress weathers are, you know, somatic um, substance, to put it <clears throat> like that. Um, so mental health is absolutely part of the picture, as you can see. So is obesity, uh, so is depression. Well, depression really is the most common and early uncovering of chronic disease in stressed communities. So all of that. So you can see it's a big order. And if we really do want to level up, you know, take the government's lingo now, if you want to level up, not just economically, but with health capital, not just economic capital, then there's some serious long term strategizing to be done there to try and tackle this, uh, not just about employment, but about a whole range of factors that are injuring people. And and final point is, sorry to be a bit despondent, but um, you know, nobody has really cracked this 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 long run economic malaise um, resulting from big industry just disappearing and all the communities and the, the the stuff that goes with that. Nobody's cracked like this. And it is causing some big problems, as we see politically as well, with the rage, um, with um, populism and so on. So a huge amounts to be said on that. But. I think I think mental health is but part of the picture. There's, there's sorry, one last thing. Sorry, I'm talking too much, but just one last thing on the mental health. There are specific issues on mental health and teenagers, which I really we were talking, weren't we, Henrietta? Um, I, I think this wave of anxiety and depression and psychoaffective disorders in the teenagers that is really what I don't think we're at the bottom of that either. And the effect of social media, too. So that is something where I really do think some proper, you know, there's lots of analysis already, but we need far more to really get at that. Is that going to be with us for generation or is it something that comes and then goes? Is it the amplitude that, that, that seems to be the issue of the prevalence of conditions or is it something that really will be carried forward by those affected into their adulthood? Don't know that that, that is a worrying feature. Let me move on now to Dulal Kumar Ban Banerjee's question, a uh, regional fellow at the RSM. Can you please address the problem of racism and bullying culture in the NHS? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, it's a serious issue, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't think I'm an expert on this. Um, uh, I'm very pleased to see that there's a race observatory that's been set up by the NHS Confederation with colleagues. I'm very pleased to see that in the last year, at least, that has been a lot, a lot more attention has been put on it at uh, different levels of the NHS. Um, and we also saw, of course, um, you know, disparities of all sorts during the pandemic um, that you will know about. And the NHS survey reports doesn't it that there is still in it there is the significant issue around as well as of course the snowy white peaks of nhs leadership as as many has have described before um i i just i don't think that i i just don't know what i can add to 
other than the fact that it is a very significant issue and that um, I think at least the leadership is now turned in that direction to try to systematically and not, not just temporarily just move towards um, addressing this through a whole variety of, 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 of means. Um, and I just really hope that it's for real this time. Um, mm -hmm. Not just for the NHS, but also other, other yeah. places. Uh, Neil Watson wants to know, in the NHS, there seems to be little appraisal and assessment of managers in the NHS with no managers sacked for incompetence. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I don't know if that's true, always true, that, that the last sentence anyway. Um, I was interviewing, and one of the privileges of my job is that I, I have a podcast, actually, and um, the podcast that we're releasing tomorrow was with um, Norman Warner, who was a health minister back in Tony Blair's day and has been knocking around the NHS for a few decades. And one of the things that he said, which I think is absolutely right, is that, you know, we have a lot of um, uh, institutions to run and manage in the National Health Service, and we probably have rather more than we have management talent to spread around. Um, so the question there, I think, is how we can can cope with that do we consolidate over fewer sites do we have some better system of buddying or peer um, support you know what exactly is the management training that we have in the nhs how strong is it uh, is it lifelong when i last looked we couldn't easily um track um how many how you know, the churn of senior managers where they came from where they went to and all that um, at times in the NHS, we have had a big go at this and then it kind of falls back again. So I do think that they are a, a um, it's a, it's the one of the most difficult jobs in Britain to manage uh, big in, NHS institutions. Um, and uh, I'm not convinced that we have the support for them that we should have or indeed the training and to encourage others at other levels to bring up. If you look at um, it's a very different system, so don't roll your eyes. But if you look at um, the Mayo Clinic, for example, they have a, a system of, of, of training management, particularly clinicians in management, that really makes your eyes water. It is so precise. It is so good. It is so systematic. And I just I don't quite understand why it's beyond the talented people that exist in the NHS to craft something that isn't a million miles away from that. And also, I suppose the other thing is, may I call her on my own tribe, medicine, why we haven't seized the day here, why we haven't led this, um, and why we've been content to live with sometimes substandard management. So, so I think there's, you know, that is a big area. I think that um, is, 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 you know, there's lots to be said, and we'll, you know, obviously the. Messenger review of NHS management, the latest in a long line of reviews, will be publishing shortly. So we'll see what extra um, the, gen the good general has to say. We are now going to shower the audience with little gems from you because your talk is being so interesting. We've got so many questions and I really want to I want to have a go at just you giving some of your thoughts, you know, maybe a few lines for each one. So let's have a go and see what happens. Um, so Peter and Joker says, with COVID-19 mortality disproportionately affected, affecting the older demographic sector who consume an above average percentage of health resources, how does this affect NHS funding in the medium term? Um, it's a short term blip. Um, I think the other issue is, that, I mean, there's obviously COVID, acute COVID. Um, so, it's, sorry, I'm not, do you mean the disease or mortality? Sorry, I, I wasn't. Um, um, mortality uh, disproportionately affecting the older demographic. So uh, they're talking about, he's talking about health resources, essentially. How does this higher resource demand impact in the medium term on NHS funding? Yes, well, well, obviously will, because um, the biggest costs that we have really are at the end of life. If you look at the age related cost curve, it's um, it's a J shape with masses of, you know, it's like, I don't know, four, five, six thousand pounds at the end of life and 50 pounds of the rest of us per year. Um, so there will be a short term blip. Um, and um, I mean, if you look 
So I know you want short answers, but if you look at the amount of money that's been put in temporarily to the NHS, it is a great deal in the last year or so for COVID. So um, things will return to normal and then we'll, um, but so I think the, the, the short term blip is, is sort of partly covered by this emergency tranches of funding that the NHS has received. Long COVID is another matter, um, but that's not really affecting the older people so much. It's uh, average age, I think it's 43. So we've got that to cope with later, but in the scheme of things, it's not, it's not going to be a major factor injuring the long-term sustainability of the NHS. Um, thank you. Fiona Sims says, hi, Jennifer, good to see you. Hi, Fiona. Picking up an earlier question, the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management, thank you. Uh, FMLM, has fellowships for juniors, as does NHSE. Um, I have national and regional fellowships, open competition annually. So that's very good. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Fiona. Then, then we've got Ravi Kumar. Can we really address the challenges of NHS without addressing the challenges of social care? What is your advice, guidance to the NHS and social care leadership to get that balance and priority right? Yeah, so thank you, Ravi. Um, Social care, well, obviously, a long running sore hasn't been solved. Um, the government doesn't show any signs at the moment of, of, of properly funding social care. The latest in the bill was to fund us um, for catastrophic, you know, subsidise us for catastrophic costs or pay above a certain level, the so called dill not cap. But um, social care is not funded very well. As a result, you see lots of people cycling in and out of hospital. So, uh, the NHS long term plan quite appropriately put in a clause to say something along the lines of um, the long term plan needs this amount of funds subject to social care being adequately funded. That was the kind of get out clause and it wasn't so. Um, so, yes, it's unfinished business. Don't know why we can't grasp that one, uh, why it's so difficult, probably because it costs, but it doesn't cost that much, not in the scheme of things. Um, but it is unless we solve that, we're going to still remain in trouble with the NHS because, you know, what's the point of having anyway, having said all that um, absent social care reform, uh, some of the uh, integrated care systems, the, the idea of integrated care systems to try and help support people to um, stay well at home and not require uh, avoidable hospital admission uh, may well help. So the collaboration may be able to sort of unlock some assets that we haven't had access before because people were working in silos but that doesn't that doesn't stop the need for um, proper social care reform and we are still waiting roger kirby has one uh, precedence prerogative roger but no one else can have two but i'll allow you to is ai the best way ahead for innovation in the nhs Thank you, Roger. AI is one form of innovation and it's certainly got huge, huge potential, but it is only one form of innovation. There will be many others. Um, and uh, I was visiting IBM. This, I promise you I don't have any shares in IBM, but I was visiting IBM yesterday and they showed me their quantum computer and said how many millions of times more powerful it will be than than other computers to develop AI. So instead of you know, stuff being crunched overnight in a normal computer, it will take less than a nanosecond. Um, so with that on board, then artificial intelligence and um, um, can can really be solving all sorts of issues. But but really, as I said earlier, uh, it's only one innovation. Um, and of course, innovations need humans to affect them. And that's where you need to have um, training and testing and um, risk assessments done by individuals, uh, by staff and to support them to, to trial and spread these innovations. And of course, not forgetting that the NHS is a service industry and that's the most important element of it. So AI is going to be hugely important and um, I think can help not just with diagnostics, but also with decision, the decision support, which may then allow um, some decisions currently made by high end specialists to be given appropriately and safely to those who are less trained and, and less expensive. So hopefully that's leaving leaving medicine to be more, um, maybe more bespoke, uh, which is what many have described. So. Thank you, Jennifer. Mary Brown makes a statement about the importance of fellowships, which is too long for me to read, and then says, I use the Health Foundation literature 
and thank you. Oh, so, thank you. Very good. Richard Jarrett says, have any other foundations mentioned by Jennifer had any effect upon governance, government policies? Oh, yes, I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> well, having having run the Nuffield Trust and having been the director of policy at the King's Fund, I'd feel a bit depressed if we didn't. So, yes, yeah, we have. And um, I mean, I can give loads of examples. Um, it, it, you know, it, you, you kind of work partly inside the tent, partly outside the tent. Uh, but when you're inside the tent, it's very less it's less visible what you can do, what you are doing to help. But um, I would say we, you know, we've done quite a lot to change and shape policy, get amendments in, uh, evaluate policies, and so on and so forth. So it, it, there's, I, I'm confident that my life hasn't been wasted. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, I'm democratically working my way through this list, but this question—I'm not quite sure about this question. It, John Rice says, "How do long waiting lists improve outcomes or reduce costs in the long term?" Long waiting lists. Well, they don't, do they? Um, and, and in fact, I think loads of GPs who will be on this call will know that as long waiting lists go up, then the blowback on general practice and the load on general practice just gets even higher. Um, so I think we're all going to try to do our best to have in the you know through the NHS recovery plan to um, to reduce the long waits and also to use the smaller much much smaller private sector to try to help um, alleviate those waiting lists as they've been helping already. We've got a few a couple more I really want to get through. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Adi says. Would it not be clinically and cost effectively justified for the NHS to stop serving unhealthy foods, potentially carcinogenic processed meats and prohibit hospital staff and inpatients from going out to hosp hospitals to smoke? Yeah, <laughs> certainly there's been a big effort to have hospitals serve more healthier food. So um, all for that, yes, absolutely right. Um, you know, especially high fats, you know, sugar, salts, high processed food. By the way, just here's, here's an interesting fact I read, you know, the Dimbleby, Henry Dimbleby had this food strategy. Did you know that uh, in this country, 40% of the food sold is, is um, ultra processed, whereas in Italy, it's 14%. So is that shows you, doesn't it? And and the NHS will be a culprit too. But and having said that, um, the previous chief executive did a lot to try to get rid of, you know, sort of uh, confectionery machines and things, and uh, unhealthy food. So, um, so short of there being a national authoritarian directive, you can't really do much at the centre, but you can set the weather, which I think the leadership has on that. Uh, I don't think you can stop, you know, in a free country, you can't prevent staff going out to get a pizza on call, um, which is probably one of the most unhealthy foods you can get. Um, but I think on NHS premises, you can do your absolute best. And th there's been huge progress when I think of what hospital food used to be like. It's completely unidentified and absolutely ghastly. So thank you. I'm going to um, ask one last question just for you to know there are many more really great ones um, in the list. Uh, Judith Barley saying, why aren't mental health, obesity, diabetes pandemics handled by public health? They do not need 42 different ICS strategies. Yeah, so I think um, I think you're right. There has to be an overarching strategy for some of these chronic diseases prevention. And indeed, OHID, you probably heard of OHID, the Office for Health Improvement Disparities is currently producing a white paper. OHID is part of NHS England that doesn't deal with the infectious disease or the hazards or all the rest of it. And it's based, and it's Chris Whitty is at its head with Janelle de Grucci. And I think you need an overarching strategy, but then because a lot of the conditions for ill health are local, and actually, the wider, if you listen to Michael Marmot, the, you know, 80 percent of our health is affected by the, what's called the wider determinants of health. So it isn't health care at all. It's the wider determinants, which means housing, education, the environment, the air we breathe, whether we've got good work or not and and other 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 things. Those, you know, income a lot of those things are more in the bailiwick of local government and um uh, and 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 all that local government has to deal with so it doesn't really make sense that there are sort of vertical national programs on these things um when a lot of the conditions for health are local so that's why there has to be a very strong local element as well as a national strategy 
I mean, there's some things that national government can do, smoking ban, for example, and, and, and obesity, as we described, and they should do those things. But much of the heavy lifting will have to be done locally. Thank you so much. Stay here for the moment. I just to do a bit of housekeeping now. First of all, to remind you all about the two sessions coming up. One is the uh, In Conversation Live with Artemis Cooper on the 22nd of June. And then on the 23rd, there is a meeting on tackling inequalities. Uh, so do, do look those up. Um, secondly, I'd want to remind you all that these uh, meetings are free, the RSM puts them on for all of you, but if you want to contribute, you can use a QR code uh, that you'll see in a minute, um, and uh, or go on our website and, uh, and contribute that way uh, to the charity. And lastly, you'll get a feedback form, feel free to fill it in, we love your contributions. And, uh, Thank you for being such an incredibly interactive audience tonight. It's been a real pleasure. And Jennifer, I've so enjoyed hearing you talk tonight. And thank you, everybody, and have a very good evening. Goodbye. Thank you, Henrietta. Bye. Bye.